AMT. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. Hello, everyone, including where Senators Joe Lieberman and Al Franken collide. Because we begin tonight watching the historic civility of the U.S. Senate breaking down under the heat of the health reform bill. In this clip, Lieberman, the independent from Connecticut who killed the public option insurance plan in the Senate, asked for more time to finish a point in a committee chaired by the Democrat Franken. Usually that's a routine request. Spending outside of these publicly supported programs, that's very significant, will provide an opportunity for broad savings in health care and health insurance for pretty much everybody in our country. Spoken for, I'm sorry, the senator has spoken for 10 minutes. I, I wonder if I could ask unanimous consent for just a, an additional moment. Um, in my capacity as senator from Minnesota, I object. Really? Oh, okay. <laughs> Don't take it personally. I will, ask, I will ask unanimous consent that uh, the remainder of my remarks be included in the record as if read. Without objection. I thank the chair. That on the full Senate floor, and gentle as Franken's rebuke may have looked, that just never happens in the U.S. Senate, and that little piece of video has gone viral online. More video picks coming up later. Also tonight, we will find out where high-tech startups are headed and if they will ignite our city's economy, and we'll hear what it's been like to be an undocumented, not worker, but college student. But to begin, an international story that was unfolding while we were distracted by the holidays and the failed airline bomber, once again, things are heating up in Iran. Just after Christmas, on the Shia Muslim holiday of Ashura, thousands of anti-government demonstrators took to the streets. Eight were killed and scores arrested. And now activists are being threatened with execution. With foreign journalists banned, news from Iran is arriving via YouTube and Twitter, as it did after the disputed June elections. But many are now relying on a virtual newsroom called the Tehran Bureau. And joining me via Skype from Boston, Tehran Bureau founder, Kelly Niknajad. And with me here in the studio, Iran Watchers Gary Sick, a senior research scholar at Columbia University who was in the Carter administration, and Mohammed Bazi, an adjunct senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and former Mideast Bureau Chief for Newsday. Welcome to all of you. Hello. Thank you very much for coming on. Um, Kelly, um, Twitter was a tool of the people protesting the elections in Iran in June. Is the same thing happening this time around? It's more difficult. They've made it more difficult because of anything that was successful. So um, they've made it even difficult to log on to email during the, you know, after the election, people could act, could log on to their email even though it was slow. Um, they had messenger services like Gmail, Yahoo, all those have been shut down. So it's they've made it much more difficult to even do very simple things like that. And the um, speed of the internet has been so slow that they can't even get YouTube video out. So it does come out eventually, and there are ways of going about it, but it's very, very difficult. And um, it, a lot of the videos usually come out the day after, or, um, you know, it, it's amazing anything gets out considering all the limitations they've put on it. So what are you collecting on Tehran Bureau and is most of it coming from professional journalists or citizen journalists in Iran? I usually don't talk about um, the background of the people that we're using um, just because um, it's so, everyone's so paranoid. Um, but they're people that I trust um, completely. I mean, if I don't trust someone, I don't work with them. I mean, even if they have good information, I won't use it because then, um, you know, there's a lot of misinformation going on around and it's the most important thing. Um, so we, the, the, the nice thing about Tehran Bureau is that we are very text dependent. So um, that's the easiest thing to get out and 
um, anonymously. Um, and we're not dependent on you know radio interviews or television interviews. So that makes our work um, a lot easier in that sense. Um, right. So Although video speaks to people in the ra in the world, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Maybe a video is worth a million words. And though foreign journalists are banned from covering the protests, we've gotten at least some sense of what's going on from video posted on the internet. So let's um, add to this discussion a look at one of those. We're going to roll it now. This is a video of the funeral of Grand Ayatollah Hossein Ali Montezeri, who was Iran's most senior dissident cleric until his death on December 19th. Tens of thousands marched in the funeral in the city of Qom. Some chanted slogans against the government. The video was posted on YouTube by calling himself only Mehdi. So, Mohammed Bazi, for you as a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, as a journalism professor at NYU, what can you learn about Iran from a citizen posted video like that? Well, there's certainly a lot of first hand information and material coming out, such as these videos. You get a sense for the size of the crowds, which is one of the things that the regime has been consistently trying to downplay and that's been trying to control that message. Um, they've been trying to uh, limit or they have successfully limited most foreign news organizations from covering any of these protests, uh, partly because they want to obscure how large the crowds have been. Um, so with people being able to take their own video, uh, to take pictures, to post these things through Twitter and YouTube and other means, uh, we can get some sense for the situation on the ground. Now, without professional journalists operating, being able to operate, um, in in Iran, it's more difficult to get a sense for the nuance and and the sort of the things going on within the opposition and certainly within the regime. Gary, besides teaching at Columbia uh, and publishing your blog, Gary's Choices, you have a private internet service for some subscribers focusing on the eight countries of the Persian Gulf. Right. I imagine with such long and deep professional and personal contacts in the region, you're getting pretty good information from Iran and you don't have to rely on journalistic sources? Well, I mean, the journalistic sources are wonderful and if you can get them, you want to have them. Uh, we don't have that luxury right now. And I must say, first of all, I mean, Borzu Daragahi from the LA Times got in there recently. Actually, did he got in, went around, they've got a stringer that's still working there. And then he pulled back out again and then wrote his stories from Beirut, but he was he got in. The other thing is, just looking at that video, the thing that struck me about it is you see little bits of green uh, mixed in with all the black chadors and the black uh, coats and so forth. Green the is the and symbol the, of the revolution. That's the uh, color of the, of the protest. That's the color of the opposition and uh, the green movement. And you can see little patches of it all the way through there. And that doesn't give you subtlety, but it does tell you that those people really were there. And you can't tell how many of them were there to, to actually warn Montessori and how many of them were there to protest, but you know a lot of them were. So let's look at part of another video. Um, this uh, shows nighttime protests where chanting has been part of the scene. This is posted on YouTube by Iran's Youth. You see, this is nighttime, and you'll hear a little bit of the chanting. Listen. And Kelly at Tehran Bureau, can you tell us a little bit about the significance of that chanting? Are you familiar with it? Sure, it's reminiscent of the 1979 revolution. Um, in 1978, um, one of the relatively safe ways of protesting, um, of demonstrating, was to come out under the cloak of the night and chant, you know, God is great, um, in kind of to defy the Shah's regime. And um, this time around, it was used um, for the same reason, but also to, I think people were thinking that, um, you know, a government that holds us out itself out to be Islamic, um, how are they going to combat something like that? How are they going to um, 
you know, crack down on us for saying God is great, which is, you know, so slamming. So it's, it's a play on it. It's, it has many different meanings. For some, it shows that they are religious and they do um, want, you know, they're, they're not against the system necessarily, especially in the beginning. I think it has escalated, but in the beginning, it was like, we're, we're still within the Islamic Republic. We're still trying to work within the rubric of the Islamic Republic. It was kind of a reminder to the regime of what happened, you know, don't make the same mistakes. And it was also, again, you know, it was nighttime. It was um, relatively um, anonymous. Um, so it was a combination of things. But um, again, more than anything, an excuse to come out and show how much, um, how upset they are with everything. And very interestingly, over the past few months, every time something happens they're very unhappy about, I get messages from people in Iran saying the Allahu Akbar is very loud tonight. You know, this is the the, um, the night is shaking because um, the Allah, Allahu Akbars are so powerful. So it's been a very powerful tool um, since the um, election this June. And so, so powerful with the context that you gave us to see a little bit of that nighttime chanting and to hear it. And Mohammed, the relationship between the official political sector and social networking online is now such that President Obama this summer actually asked Twitter to delay some scheduled maintenance so that information could keep flowing from Iran. Um, what's the significance of the administration doing that? What does it reveal? Well, the administration saw Twitter as one of the ways that first-hand information was coming out from Iran right after the election. Uh, during the beginning of this crackdown. Uh, at that point, there were still foreign journalists operating, quite a few foreign journalists able to operate uh, right after the election. And then the crackdown began and the restrictions on journalists um, intensified. Um, you know, we, we should also be careful, though, not to brand this as this Twitter revolution. I mean, this is really something taking place in the streets and something taking place um, within this context, it's not being driven uh, by Twitter, it's not being driven by YouTube, it's being driven by real grievances that people have against this regime. Gary, before you go, two things real quick. There was a media context to the 1979 revolution when the U.S. Embassy and the hostages there were taken. Um, Nightline was born out of that crisis, originally called America Held Hostage, where they did a half hour on ABC on that every single night. And that was revolutionary for American television at that time. For you working in the White House on that crisis with President Carter, was that precursor to Nightline helpful, harmful, or neutral? Well, I think I was on their very first tape. Uh, they came in, we, we were all sitting around a table in the seventh floor of the State Department the night that the hostages were actually taken and uh, Ted Koppel and his crew came in and did a circuit around the room, and I was sitting at the table. And I think that was the very first edition of that thing. Because it's so fanned the flames, and oh, no, it did. I remember no, no. it. Uh, it was so fanned the flames of American nationalism and resentment that I wonder if it made it you know, easier for the hostage takers and harder for you to get them out. You know, it, I, don't think it, I don't think it changed the ability of getting them out. I think it really changed the dynamics inside the United States in terms of the political dynamics of the thing. They had their own story to tell. They were telling it in their own way. And because there wasn't a lot of information, really, there was very little, official or unofficial, that was the story. And so the American people basically knew as much about this as the government did. And you, know, and you were suddenly faced with this thing where everybody was second guessing you. Uh, whatever you did, whatever you said, they, had, they, they knew what was going on and they were second guessing. We in journalism think that's a good thing, transparency, like it or not. Uh, Have we come full circle in Iran? Because the chants in 1979 were death to America. Now the chants are death to the dictators. Yeah. This is a real, uh, this is a real movement. I have to restrain myself because I sat through that revolution. I went, was in that revolution and, and the hostage crisis. And so much of it looks the same. I mean, the, the, the sequence of events is just remarkably similar. Is the government going down? You know, uh, there are, a, I would have to give you a longer answer because, you know, nobody knows. And that's the other thing I learned from the revolution. Anybody who tried to predict what was going to happen next really got it wrong. It was, you don't dare do that. So we'll just have to follow events and support democracy all over the world, including in Iran. Thank you all very much.
Thank you. Coming up next, the founder of U2Gov.org. U2Gov. It's a social networking site that connects citizens to their elected officials. This is Brian Lehrer Live. Ma, guess what? I went back to college. No, I didn't quit my job. I'm finishing my degree with a CUNY online bachelor's in business. I interact online with real City University of New York faculty on a schedule that fits my busy life. Ma, you should look who's teaching at CUNY. And it all leads to a high quality Bachelor of Science degree in business. I can attend class anywhere, anytime. Yes, Mom, even at your house Friday night for dinner. The CUNY Online Baccalaureate. Get back to business. This is CUNY TV, the City University of New York. Did you know CUNY leads the way for students with disabilities? CUNY leads to my career as a healthcare professional. CUNY leads to my career as an accountant. CUNY leads to my career as a music teacher. CUNY leads means linking employment, academics, and disability services. If you're a CUNY student with a visible or invisible disability, the City University of New York offers eligible students free career development and placement services. Gain access to exciting employment opportunities through the power of a CUNY education. As an employer, CUNY Leads provides me with a more qualified, diverse workforce. Each campus has its own Leads counselor, a go-to person who knows you. And helps you enjoy every aspect of college life. For more information and to find out if you qualify, visit cuny.edu slash CUNY Leads. CUNY Leads to the career I always wanted. This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. It's clear that social networks can be powerful tools for getting candidates elected to public office, but can Facebook-like software keep citizens in close touch with officials after Election Day? Can Twitter add up to a people's lobby in the United States? And can government itself use social networks to serve us better? Alan Silberberg, founder of U2Gov, that's the word U, the number two, and G-O-V, U2Gov.org, thinks about all this and has helped to design software to make it happen. He joins us via Skype from Los Angeles. Hello, welcome to the program. Hi, how are you doing tonight? Doing great. You know, Facebook and Twitter are not about action. They're about gossip. They're about dating. But your goal is to harness social networking for action? Well, yeah, and then the fact it's interesting that you set it up like that because one of the questions that we asked in the beginning in creating UDGov was basically, you know, uh, uh, how do people communicate with their elected official? And when you start looking at things like social media, like you said, uh, a lot of people use it for talking about dates and their best uh, restaurants or, you know, uh, food that they're cooking or whatever it may be. Uh, a lot of picture sharing, a lot of video sharing. Uh, there's also a lot of activism that, I and mean, there's a lot of groups that are using things like Facebook to push out, you know, their own information, and they create Facebook fan pages, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but we looked at it and sort of asked another question, which was, okay, so now that you're doing all that activity on, on social media, uh, what are you doing to, you know, to capture that action? What kind of energy are you are you actually capturing at the end of it? So does that assume? And so to that end, we. Sorry, does that assume that your local elected officials or your members of Congress are actually looking at uh, their Twitter feeds or their Facebook uh, walls? Well, the ones that are setting up the accounts certainly are. Um, and I would imagine that at this point, you know, uh, Twitter has gotten in deep enough in the vernacular that or most likely most political staffs are starting to monitor, you know, the conversation that's going on. Um, not only on Twitter, on Facebook, but also on other media platforms. Um, you know, there's a lot of conversation that's happening at a real-time basis, 24 hours a day. You guys run something called a Government 2.0 Camp. What kind of camp is that? Uh, uh, well, it's certainly not the kind with bunk beds and mosquitoes. Um, you know, what we're doing is we're convening a, 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 a number of leaders in the Government 2.0 space. Uh, technologists, uh, innovators, government uh, officials, and also people in, in other parts of social media, and bringing um, together really these people to ask, 
ask a number of questions, which is, okay, so now that government 2.0 is sort of, people are starting to talk about it and, you know, things are happening, um, what does it mean for the companies that are involved in it, number one? Uh, number two, you know, what kinds of things can be done to soften some of the language that's used in technology and, and try to make things more approachable? For example, um, you know, when people talk about government 2.0, most people kind of scratch their heads and they say, well, I really don't know what that is. However, um, if you say to them, well, what we're really talking about is, is a platform whereby, you know, instead of standing in line at the DMV, you can go online and, do, and take care of your business. And, and that kind of thing really resonates with people. Your um, site is for-profit? Uh, our business, UtaGov, is a for-profit business. Uh, Gov20LA, that the camp that you just mentioned, um, we're not trying to make any money off that. That is something really we're just bringing together a number of, of top leaders. Um, and uh, what we've done is looked at it from this perspective. Our website is free. Um, we do not advertise to people, and nor do we charge a fee uh, to get on uh, register for free and lobby your elected officials at the state and federal levels. So the company is also a consulting company and provides a platform um, that is for sale to, to government agencies. So what we do is on the public side is we keep the whole thing free and open. Do you have an example of where community organizing via Facebook or Twitter or any other social networking site has had an impact on government action or government policy in a different way than old-fashioned emailing or writing a letter to your congressman might have? Um, most definitely. I think that, you know, we started seeing a real trend, you know, during the 2008 elections. Um, but, but, but basically, um, in the last year or so, we've seen a number of, of services that have popped up that allow people to create uh, online petitions, for example, and circulate them and get a lot of people to sign those petitions in a very, very, very rapid manner. Um, which then translates to, you know, a huge amount of emails and, and traffic, et cetera, phone calls going to elected officials or wherever that, that petition might be directed at. For and example, those online um, petitions are taken seriously? They're not written off because they're online petitions? Well, I think that they're, they're probably classified in the same level that other petitions are. You know, they're, everything is, you have to take it with a grain of salt and sort of see where it's coming from and, you know, what, what's the source of this? Why are they driving it? Uh, is this a paid for a pro, you know, project or is this something where organically it grew and, you know, people suddenly started coming together via Twitter or Facebook or other social media and said, hey, here's this issue. We need to, you know, jump on it. And so I think it depends on how you look at it. And, and it really means that you sort of have to take a step back on, all, on everything and not just instantly retweet something or instantly repost something on your Facebook page. But maybe think about it and click on the link and see what you know what you're actually like talking about. This is a two-way street because you have citizens organizing through these social networks, but government has to be organized around it too at their end for this communication to be effective. Do you see the Obama administration following through on its promises for more online transparency now that they're actually in office? Because it was a theme of the campaign. Are they really doing it? I think that it's a, I have to answer that in a measured approach. On one level, yes, um, they're, they're, they're switching to open source platforms. Um, the White House, the Security Exchange Commission, the Pentagon, um, our other, other agencies are issuing memos, uh, open source directives or the open government directive, for example. Uh, but on the other hand, there's also um, not been any decrease in the number of uh, classified documents. Um, there's not been any decrease in the secrecy in the way that things are being done. And it's still just as hard for people to um, to access a lot of information. Now that will change because of websites like data.gov and other things where the government is suddenly taking all these different feeds of all this different information in a real-time basis and putting it out to the public. Um, the public's just starting to get aware of things like that. So I think that when you talk about government 2.0, part of it is just the aware education that, that has to go into that and, and, and saying to people, look, you know, you invest time in your 401k, you invest time in your career, in your education. It's just as important to invest time in, in you know, the civic life and something that is Well, that um, would put a lot of burden on individual uh, citizens. Your overall life. Journalists and well, activist groups are also taking a lot of data, and I'm, I know they're taking the lead. 
in making this data kind of meaningful in a digestible way to the public. Just real quick, we have 30 seconds left. Tell us the Craig Newmark story. Craig from Craigslist did something from a train along the lines of what you yeah, do? Yeah, CNN just ran a story about this a couple of days ago, actually, interestingly, that he was on a train in, in San Francisco, Bart, and um, tweeted that, you know, that the, the Bart manager or whoever manages the Twitter account, that something was you know, wrong with the temperature on the train and got a response. And so, you know, on, on just shows that there's these agencies are now using are using media in such a way, you know, what used to be unthinkable, i.e., you know, any sort of regular citizen contacting their government, saying, hey, I have a problem, and it's not a big problem, but it's a little thing, and you got to deal with it. And suddenly, people, and suddenly, the government, are they're at least the ones who are turning this on and allowing themselves to, are becoming part of that two-way communication, as you said earlier. Maybe it helps to be Craig from Craigslist in a situation like that, but anybody can sure do it, it and theoretically get a response. Thank you very much for coming on. Keep it up. Thank you. Appreciate it. It's Brian Lehrer Live. Here are this week's online video picks. Number one, on Christmas Eve, I watched It's a Wonderful Life, the classic Jimmy Stewart movie about a community mortgage lender being squeezed by the big money bags in town who was threatening townspeople with foreclosure on their homes. Sound familiar? It's a Depression-era movie, but it sure did look relevant to now. Well, by sheer coincidence, the Huffington Post noticed this too, and now they have a video asking you to manage your money today as if you were trying to save Jimmy Stewart in the classic movie. Instead of watching It's a Wonderful Life, imitate it. Did you put any real pressure on these people of yours to pay those mortgages? Times are bad, Mr. Potter. A lot of these people are out of work. But foreclosed. I can't do that. These families have children. Uh -huh. And not my children. Big cities across the country are seeing a big jump in the number of people losing their homes. Thompson, how much do you want? But it's your own money, now, George. What do you find about that? How much do you want? Well, I can get along with 20 all right. $20, fine. And I'll sign yeah, the paper. You don't have to sign anything. I know you. You pay when you can. That's okay. Millions and millions of dollars paid out in bonuses by the insurance giant AIG. The 20 largest bailed out banks received $283 billion in taxpayer money. And the executives running those 20 troubled banks still received enormous paychecks. I turned to the person I've done business with for several years, and he's no problem. That person was CEO of a community bank. Banks like his have funds to loan, even while the larger banks have slowed or even stopped their lending. I don't have one single penny in any of your banks, not one, because I don't want my money put into CDOs and credit default swaps and making humongous bonuses. So if big banks can deny us credit while taking our tax dollars, then why not support the banks who are little enough to fail if we don't? But what if you don't have enough money to put any in the bank right now? Then you're probably paying attention to the cost of food. But Good Magazine wants you to look at that in a different way, too. Video pick number two on the high cost of cheap food.
It just depends on your definition of cost, I guess. Video pick number three this week comes from NASA. If they can't teach you to fly like an astronaut, they at least have the coolest way to teach you how to graph like a numbers geek. This video is directed to students. Well, let's say we want to travel to other planets. We obviously need food to get there and back, so we want to see the relationship between the planet we're going to and how much food each person will need to take with them. So first, label your axes. As a rule, we always put our independent variable on the x-axis. In this case, we'll put the number of days it takes to get to any given planet. On the y-axis, we'll put the dependent variable. Why is it called the dependent variable? Well, in our example, the amount of food we need in kilograms depends upon how long it takes to get there and back. So let's think of some examples. Ah, uh, the International Space Station. That's about a seven-day mission. Since we need about 1.83 kilograms of food per day, that's, uh, let's see, 12.81 kilograms. Now, let's go to the moon. We'll put in a few of the Apollo missions for reference. Now we have a bunch of dots. It sort of makes sense, but let's connect them all with a line. Ah, now that looks better. We can now see the relationship between how long a mission is and how much food we need to take. This lets us ask some good questions, like how much food would it take to get to, say, Mars? Wow, that's a lot of food for one person. Fortunately, NASA engineers think about these questions every day. Well, there you go, folks. Next time you want to see how two things relate to one another, that's right, draw a graph. That's a great thing about today's video apps. Math isn't boring anymore. Beautiful data visualization sites are springing up to make research findings come alive. Nice job by NASA to animate some of the basics. Video pick number four from Bonnier on Vimeo.com, the magazine of the future. You can't touch the glossy pages, but oh, the things your electronic reader can see. One of the things uh, that we've observed about the way the magazine works and some of its properties are uh, certainly just in its physicality that the covers are very kind of, they can be seen almost as a badge or they can be seen on tables and indeed they can quite often go on to become quite emblematic and quite iconic. We can remember some covers as far back as say the 60s. It's really easy when we think about the way that information's been abstracted and channels have been broken down. The way we expect to receive information now is diversely available across all sorts of devices and channels. But it's, uh, it's easy to forget the importance of the, the physical context of, of, of consuming news and, and magazines. And a huge numbers of people still consume uh, information in those formats. We've moved on to look at some of the ways that the device might occupy the world, especially since that's so important for magazines. Uh, what happens when it's put down, and left in an idle state, how the spine might behave. It manages to strike a, a very capable balance between very luxurious, impactful, dramatic imagery, um, large photographs, inviting, engaging images, and also sort of richer, deeper reading experiences where you may be able to lose yourself in an article or much more kind of a much chewier piece of content. Of course, these magazines of the future may never even exist unless they can figure out how to make money, something to replace the advertising. Remember advertising? It used to be such a lucrative New York industry. And video pick number five, the next time someone sidles up to you in a fast food restaurant and asks if you want to buy Avatar on DVD, stop for a minute to appreciate the artistry that goes into making that bootleg disc. The video troupe Free Love Forum did just that. When Tim came to me with this project, I said yes, immediately to this journey. For me, the real impetus for the project was the movie Avatar. Um, you know, we heard Jim was going to be making the movie and it just clicked, you know, this is going to be huge. Let's get out there with a the camera and film it at the theater. He is one of the bootlegging industry's true visionaries. If, if you end up shooting and you get caught, you know, to act like you're retarded? Yeah. The scope of this project is so massive that we've actually had to design new technologies just to realize it. For the first time ever, we're using something called the Image Capture Helmet. Uh, it really transports the audience into the theater, and it makes you feel like you are really at Avatar. <laughs> Hello? 
Yeah, I'm at the movie. One of the truly landmark things that Tim is doing in this movie is he's shooting the film from two different angles. So we are seeing it from the front and the left. Using the two camera setup from the theater, I've been able to stitch together the images to recreate the 3D IMAX experience at home. The visuals are so stunning, it really deserves to be watched on a reasonably sized TV. And those are this week's online video picks. Where can I get one of those helmets? This is Brian Lehrer Live, where web video meets the issues. For most of us, the aughties was a down decade worth forgetting. But for tech watchers, it was a decade of surprising optimism and innovation. In our pockets, most of us are carrying more communication and computing power than we dreamed possible 10 years ago. So what's next? And will some of the innovations come from New York startups and create jobs here? With us to discuss what might await us in the decade to come are Nicholas Carlson, senior editor of Silicon Alley Insider, Back with us, Albert Wenger from Union Square Ventures, and via Skype from California, New York startup founder, Chris Dixon. Welcome to all of you. Um, Albert, was one of the things about the last decade that the financial barriers to starting a new business actually got lower? Significantly lower. Um, the cost to, for the kind of business that we're talking about um, with the web businesses, um, the cost to getting going has gone out, down probably more than an order of magnitude, more than 10x. Um, today, we see a lot of startups that get everything operational, a site launched, people using it, and they'll have spent less than $100,000. And they'll have done it with their own money or with friends and family money. Uh, and especially for consumer services, that is just radically different from consumer what it was services. in Consumer services, can you give me an example? Um, anything, something like Twitter. I mean, something like Twitter was launched for very little money initially. Um, Silicon Alley Insider. We don't really call anything here Silicon Alley anymore, do we? That's right. No, it's more of a, a metaphor. It's, it's, it's just the New York tech scene. You know, it rhymes with valley, so it's been a convenient pun for a while. And so were the O's a good decade for the New York tech scene? Was tech migrating in or migrating out? Well, it's been a good uh, decade for the tech media scene. Uh, you know, I saw you guys were citing the Huffington Post earlier. That's a New York tech startup that's doing very well. So, you know, you have Gawker Media, which is sort of revolutionized media as well on the, on the Internet. So I think it, it, when you go to New York, you, it's, you get the, the big mix of media and tech. And so it's been a great decade there. So, Chris, uh, tell us about your business called Hunch. Sure. Um, Hunch, it's, uh, it's a website that um, any, any of your viewers can just go to right now if they want. And it uh, basically gives you kind of recommendations on any sort of topic. So, for example, um, if you're buying a camera or if you're uh, looking for a restaurant, uh, it asks you a series of questions and gives you a recommendation at the end. Um, I, I, actually, Albert, you were talking about it, an app uh, off the air that may enable people to uh, check the health department inspection status of restaurants in New York City. Well, New York City, um, the city government and, and <clears throat> also federal government, everybody's making a lot more data available. Um, and New York City had a, a contest called the Big Apps Contest. Uh, and one of the apps that was created was taking the data from the health department and putting it right on your mobile, on your, on your cell phone. Uh, and that takes data that was previously buried and now makes it really actionable and very valuable. Um, so is that the kind of thing we might see on Hunch or uh, only the fun stuff? <laughs> uh, no, we, uh, we, we actually want it to be sort of used in a, in a serious way, the way that it's sort of like a search engine that you'd use it both for kind of serious stuff and also for uh, whimsical stuff. It's sort of a general utility. So, um, and then also, uh, uh, you know, on, uh, separately I also, um, um, do have a um, co-founder of a seed venture fund, which does a lot of investing in New York. Um, That's so. actually, a, I think, a super important point about what's happening in New York, <clears throat> which is that there's much more capital for startups available and capital from smart people. So Chris started something called Founder Collective, um, which has founders in it, as the name suggests, and <clears throat> all people who have gone through the startup process and who can really add a ton of value. So, and they're covering uh, an area that's really important, which is the whole seed, early getting going area. But it's also true that there's much more venture money available in New York than it's ever been. So, 
Um, Boston-based firms are investing in New York now. Even Silicon Valley firms are coming to New York. So Excel and Kleiner and some of those names all now have major investments in New York City. And Nicholas, is there a kind of tech startup that tends to develop in New York and some other kind that tends to develop in Boston or San Francisco? Is there kind of a regional culture around this? Sure, you, you see more uh, tech focused, really hardcore tech stuff in San Francisco. Like I said before, you see a lot of media stuff. You know, a lot of startups that aren't maybe necessarily hardcore technology are like sort of, they, t they take advantage of how you can market to people on Facebook or on Twitter. And a lot of those industries, it's a small, a lot of those little startups are doing really well, sort of replacing advertising like you were talking about before. Uh, and it, how about the, the mobile app? Industry that seems to right. be exploding. Right. No, that's absolutely true. There's you know, a hundred thousand apps on the iPhone right now, and that's it's an exploding ecosystem. People are actually making money selling pieces of software again, not just giving it away on the internet. There's a great one based in New York called Foursquare. It's where you can you go to a restaurant or you go to a bar or something like that, and it allows you to check in in such a way that you let all your friends know, hey, here's where I'm hanging out tonight. You don't have to do this; it's all voluntary. But it's a great way to sort of like. Be social. If you you know, say it's Friday night and you don't know where your friends are, you open your Foursquare up and you say, "Oh, this person is at the bar around the corner. I'm going to go hang out with them there." So yeah, that's a New York State based startup, and there's a lot of great ones. So where do you see the future growth for Hunch, uh, Chris? Is it in advertising to people who are using the site in the way you described before, or how does a business like yours grow? Yeah, well, no, I mean, um, <clears throat> our business model is very similar to. Um, the, the model of Google's so that, uh, for example, when you, at the end of the process, when you, when you, if we show you a camera that you like, um, there's a little link, and if you click on that link um, and purchase a camera, we get paid for that. Um, in the same way that on Google, some people, I think most people are aware that like the, the links at the top and on the right are, are sponsored links that they're getting paid for. Um, but uh, you know, so so it's a pretty well established business model at this point. It was something that emerged over this last decade, um, and now is, is sort of um, uh, kind of mature. I'd also just want to add that uh, uh, one of the interesting th Nicholas mentioned Foursquare, which actually Albert um, is the investor in, um, and I think one of the interesting things that's happened recently. I'm out in California now. It used to be that, as Nicholas said, um, New York was sort of only doing media and. Uh, advertising startups. Now you're seeing stuff like well, my own company, Hunch, which is sort of like a search engine, and then like Foursquare is sort of like the hottest thing out here in California, and everyone's checking in. And um, I think you see you're starting to see kind of a um, a bit of a kind of a reversal where New York is is actually really leading the way, and uh, you know Albert's firm is probably at the center of that. So Albert, does this translate to jobs in New York? It, it absolutely does. Um, you know. Um, it takes a while. I mean, these companies start out very small. Uh, you know, Foursquare started out with two people, now they're up to six. Um, but yeah, this very much creates jobs. And I, I don't know how, how big Hunch is now, but um, <clears throat> it's a part of the economy that doesn't get that much attention in New York. Um, everybody tends to focus on the financial services industry. But if you take the New York Tech Meetup as some proxy indicator, there are thousands of people registered. Every time it meets, there are Last time I think there were 700 people there. Um, I think it would be actually an interesting exercise to tally up across not just the venture back companies, but the tech startups in general to, to see how much employment has been created. I, I, I suspect it's quite substantial. So Nick, I don't know if you've tracked migration in relation to this, if this is in your beat, but historically people would come to New York from all over the country. They grow up in Kansas and they come here because they wanted to work for NBC or you know, Wall Street. Are people coming here now because it's a technological innovation center? Absolutely. I was at one of these meetups, and you know, there's a, the college student next to me feverishly taking notes. You see it all the time. People are definitely moving here. I mean, I don't want to take anything away from the valley. People go there, definitely. I mean, it, it's an entrepreneurial hub, but New York is, it, people are attracted to it. There, there are a couple I mean, of Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, like, no one in my company, for example, is from New York originally, and um, we, we, for example, recruit most of our people out of, uh, you know, MIT and places like that, and they all um, just generally love to move to New York. You know, it's sort of a big playground for sort of extended college experience, so it's a really great sort of place to recruit engineers. And it's interesting that you're talking about meetups as kind of a badge of honor here, because in theory, 
in the digital age, people can sit in their homes in Wisconsin or Louisiana or wherever and do this all virtually, but it still matters to be somewhere? Well, I, I think Chris kind of um, said it right. New York is a wonderful city, and so incredibly talented people want to come and live in, in this great city, and that talent pool works well with the kind of startups and the kind of innovation that's now happening. Um, some of it is engineering, and that and and the ability to recruit engineers to New York has changed tremendously over the last decade. And part of the, I attribute part of that to Google, who's brought a lot of engineers here. But um, but the other side of the equation, which are people who are creating design, who are defining product, there's a lot of creativity that goes into that because a lot of the innovation that's taking place is innovation that's at the user interface level, it's at the social level. So there's more, as much social engineering as there's technology engineering that goes into that. And New York attracts great people who want to work in those areas. So did you all look at the Google uh, Nexus One Android phone that came out yesterday? Did you already get How a look at it? How could you avoid it? It was everywhere, <laughs> wasn't it? <laughs> And for somebody as savvy about this kind of thing as you, did right. you look at it and go, ah, or did you go, wow, or something in between? Uh, it's a beautiful phone. It, uh, it promises to uh, really be a competitor to the iPhone. I personally don't think that it's quite up to, to being a rival. We talked about before how the iPhone has 100,000 apps. The uh, Android operating system, which the Google Nexus One runs on, has only you know, a, hand, a couple thousand apps on it. Also, it can't actually store as many apps on it, so you can't have just like pages of different apps that you're using. And finally, uh, people forget that the iPhone is a really good iPod. And the Nexus one, I don't think, is quite as good. As people, you know, we call them the normals in my world. The normal people still love to listen to music on their iPod, and that's the main reason they want an iPhone, because it's an iPod and a phone. Yeah, so Chris, who needs 100,000 apps? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of apps. I think, um, <laughs> I mean, to me, the, the really exciting thing happening on the mobile space is that Basically, for the last, I don't know, 10 years, the, the wireless carriers, Verizon, AT&T, et cetera, have had a chokehold on all the software uh, that goes on phones, which basically meant that entrepreneurs, for the most part, um, couldn't do much, sort of, couldn't, couldn't create sort of interesting things like Foursquare, for example. Um, and what you're seeing is really kind of a shift of power um, away from them and, and towards sort of more open systems, which I think is, is, is potentially going to, I think a lot of people think, be sort of a major um, next area of growth and innovation. Chris, come back, come back to New York. <laughs> I'm, I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I love New York and I plan to spend the rest of my life there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Thank you both for joining us. Pleasure. It's going to be an interesting decade in technology in New York and hopefully a very productive one for jobs in our city. This is Brian Lear Live, where web video meets the issues. Did you know that there are about 65,000 college students in America who are undocumented? Many of them brought to America as young children. Nothing illegal about going to college, even though you're not a legal immigrant, but it rules out federal loans and many other opportunities. As early as tomorrow, the New Jersey legislature may vote on a bill to give such students low in-state tuition rates at state schools. New York and 10 other states already do that. To begin exploring this, here is the story of one student named Sonia. At a very young age, I knew I was undocumented. I knew that I was different. So I'm from Ecuador. I was sent by my parents to come to New York City when I was five years old, and ever since I've been living in Harlem. I remember one time there were seats to go to Japan because um, we were taking Japanese courses. Everybody were, you know, getting their passports ready, and I'm like, I can't go. It hits you after a while, you know, like all these trips that you're like suitable to go, like your resume is perfect. You're right on point with the requirements, but yet, you know, the lack of those nine digit numbers that affects your, your final outcome, like you can't go. And those were like the first things that hit me that I knew that my status would hold me back. If I had my, um, my social security numbers and everything on point, I would have definitely gone to Cornell University. That was my dream school and they wanted me. But once they found out the whole undocumented situation, they were like, we're not going to be able to help you out financially wise. And to this day, I'm like, what if I had gone to Cornell University? And, you know, what if I got the scholarship? What if I could have gone to study abroad? How would have my life change? Yeah. I always loved reading poetry. 
I want to wake up one day and not worry about giving society an explanation of who I am. Spoken word and hip hop like kind of meshed together for me. It was just an outlet for me to heal and to balance out my most inner thoughts of I'm a failure or, you know, yes, I can. And I want to be that role model saying, you know, you can be undocumented and you can be Ecuadorian and, and still make it. Those nine digits numbers should not hold you back from what you want to do. And Sonia joins us live here in the studio along with Lindsay Lazarski, who just graduated from the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism and produced that and other videos about undocumented studi students. Those videos can be found at 9magicnumbers.com. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for having us. Yes. Uh, Sonia, so you had to give up the Cornell dream. Yes, I did. But um, you're moving ahead as a college student. Yes, and luckily CUNY University, CUNY, CUNY College, Hunter College. So, you know, even though I wasn't able to go to Cornell, I'm still having a good education at Hunter. Does the fact of being undocumented weigh on you much on a day-to-day -day basis as a college student? It does. Um, like, tuition for us is due this Friday. Um, and now I have to make special calls to my scholarship folks um, and letting them know that they have to send, you know, the um, excuse for not being able to, for me to pay my own tuition. And it just, you have to realize that even when you get your bachelor's, what are you going to do with it? As many other folks, once they graduate, they're going to be able to apply for jobs and send out their resumes. I, on the other hand, if I don't have my documentations by then, I have to rethink my plan. Even though I have that bachelor's, what am I left with? Lindsay, are there many students in Sonia's position? Um, yes. Um, as you mentioned before, um, every year uh, about 65,000 students, uh, undocumented students, graduate from high school. Um, but only 5 uh, to 10 percent actually go on to college. So there are a number of students um, like Sonia, kind of faced in, in this paradox of wanting higher education, um, but uh, the, the challenges uh, that come along with that uh, are quite difficult. I can imagine people watching this thinking, she's getting a scholarship, she's getting in-state tuition breaks, what about my kids, or me, here legally, and behind her in this line for whatever reason? There are definitely, um, you know, this is definitely a controversial issue. Um, in 1982, the Supreme Court decided that every student, documented or not, um, should have the opportunity to equal access to elementary and secondary education. And, um, well, we have to ask ourselves, well, what about after? Um, high school. Does anybody other than journalists confront you with that question? Um, all the time. Um, I'm part of an organization, so when we have conferences regarding undocumentation and the DREAM Act, um, they ask you questions like, you're taking the seat of my, of my child, or you're taking the money of my child. But at the end of the day, I remind them, you know, education is a right for everybody. So it shouldn't be my child over your child. You mentioned the DREAM Act. Yes. Which some viewers know what it is, some don't. How old were you when you came here? I was five years old. Five years old. Yes. So your parents brought you here. Yes. You, you had nothing to say about it. I had nothing to say. All I knew that I was going to be with my family. And the DREAM Act would legalize people like you, who were little kids when you came. You've grown up American exactly. in the United States. You didn't make any choice to sneak across the border or anything like that. But here you are stuck in this position. Yes, and the thing with the DREAM Act is that they make sure that people don't have criminal records. Um, they're making sure that you are a student either going to college, who are going to enroll in college, or serving in the military. So of course, this is an issue that people should understand that I'm in that position, and, it's, and it shouldn't be a position that nobody should be in, ha like doubting your potential in, in this life. Like, Yes, I'm undocumented, but I have a future, 
and nobody can take that away from me, even like those nine magic numbers. The nine magic numbers refers to? Uh, the social security number. Um, I interviewed a number of undocumented youth uh, right here in New York City, and every single time I interviewed um, one of the students, the social security card just kept coming up. I didn't have a social security card. I couldn't write down those nine numbers. Eventually, one of the students said, if I only had those nine magic numbers, I could have a job. So that became the project. And that became the name of the website. And if people want to see some of your other videos mm -hmm. that revolve around people other than Sonia, they can go to ninemagicnumbers.com and see them. Absolutely. Um, there's also, um, for other people who'd like to share comments or share their own experiences, there's also an opportunity uh, for people uh, and students to do that. So what are you going to do next? Right now, I'm still studying a Hunter, um, double majoring, and I'm looking forward to graduating. And then... What are your two majors? I am majoring in Women's and Gender Studies and African, Puerto Rican, Latino Studies. Yeah. And with that, I'm looking forward to going for my PhD. Good luck. Thank you. What do you think is a fair way for the government to treat undocumented students? We have to understand the fact that this country is made out of uh, broken down, it has a broken down immigration system. And regardless if it's undocumented students or undocumented families, there should be a fair way. You have to find a better system um, and definitely find a way for us to have that access to higher education. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Good luck to you, Thank Sonia. You. Good luck finding a journalism job in the real world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and that's it for this week's show. We're here live Wednesday nights at 730 or anytime online at TV, And tune in to my daily radio show, 10 a.m. on WNYC Radio, tomorrow morning, What If You're Not In Love With Your Baby? That's 10 a.m. on WNYC 93.9 FM and AM 820. Talk to you then.